We're going to continue on the introductory buffer overflow concepts that we looked at last time. So now I've got a directory with two files in it, example1.c and a make file. If we have a look at example one, it's pretty similar to the program that we started off with last time. Uh, we have some standard library in imports, uh, two functions, print message and get message that a user has uh, written. We also have main. Inside main, we print some status messages about where we are in the program and what we're doing. Then we call this get message function here. And when we return, we just print that we're back in main, uh, print an exit message, and note that we are exiting. The get message function that main actually calls has a 50 character string buffer. Um, also prompts the user to enter a message, reads whatever the user types into that buffer, and echoes it back to the user. There's a comment here that notes th this is the actual vulnerability in the program. We talked last time about the origin of buffer overflow vulnerabilities, and essentially it's that C, or a lot of these string reading or data reading functions in C don't do bounds checking. So gets is one of those functions. So the get string function or gets will read the data that's uh, entered by the user, write it into the buffer that's specified as the parameter, regardless of how long the buffer actually is. So the user can enter in well over 50 characters and potentially corrupt the stack inside of the program, overwriting things like the previous stack frames, base pointer, uh, its local variables, the return address back into the calling function, right, and essentially crash the program. This time, what we're gonna try to do is craft a value to insert into the stack to change the behavior of the program. So you'll notice the uh, get message gets called, right? main calls that, but this print message function never actually gets called through the program legitimately. So what we're gonna try to do with our first non-trivial buffer overflow is to try to inject um, the address of this function wherever it ends up getting mapped to in memory and when we buffer overflow this function, when it returns, we don't actually want it to return to main, we want it to return into this print message function, uh, which will then uh, sort of print this um, welcome to buffer overflows message. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, first, obviously we need to compile this program. Uh, just have a quick look at the make file that's been supplied with this example. So there's a, an ELF32 target. Again, we're just using 32-bit executables in our example right now because the memory addresses for 64 bits are a little bit longer. We'll probably do one later, but this is just easy for now. Um, so the switches we're using for GCC don't use any optimization, no built-in functions. So this would do things like replace printf statements with put string if there's no parameters, things like that. Uh, we're gonna disable a few memory protection features, which we are gonna talk about later. But for example, um, this puts some protection mechanism inside the stack to determine if the stack has been corrupted or overflown. So we're gonna turn that off for now. We're going to set our output as a 32-bit executable. We're gonna turn on all the warnings. We're gonna use the C11 C standard. We're gonna add extra debug info so that when we're debugging this thing and stepping through it in GDB, we just get more information. Uh, we're also gonna turn off the non-executable stack memory protection so that we can run code out of the stack eventually. Uh, we're gonna specify that our output file is, is example1.out and our input file is example1.c. There's also um, just a, a clean target in here that should uh, delete the output file if you don't want it anymore. Okay, so I'm gonna type make. GCC is actually gonna warn me um, that gets is insecure uh, and that we shouldn't use it. But I mean, the whole point of this is to write an insecure program, so it's fine. So last time we saw that we could trivially overflow this program um, by passing it too much data. Uh, we'll just run the program the way it's meant to be executed uh, briefly. So we run example one out. It says, hey, give us a message, hi. Right. Um, it echoes the message back to us and exits. So last time we saw that we could use something like Python uh, to craft sort of a custom message um, to keep ourselves from typing a lot of keystrokes and inject these into the program. So I'm gonna write the character A 100 times and I'm gonna pass that. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna pass that into our program. So when it prompts the user here for the message, it's gonna actually read from the pipe and it's gonna read 100 A's uh, into what was a 50 byte character buffer and sort of override that um, by an additional 50 bytes, probably corrupt the stack and crash the program. Okay. So calling get message, uh, enter a message. This is where the program would have read from the pipe. 
echoes the string back to us, um, and then the program terminates with a segmentation fault. And because we ran ulimit c unlimited when we entered our terminal, uh, we actually get a core dump file here. We can have GDB examine that core dump file for us. Um, we don't really need to step through it too much. We're actually just interested in sort of the default output of GDB here where it tells us what instruction crashed the program. So to save us having to like enter and then leave um, GDB every time, we can do something like GDB, start in quiet mode, process this core file, and then we can also say um, execute the instruction quit. So this will basically load GCC, um, it'll, send, it'll print the one line that we need, and then it immediately quits. Okay, so that was just my own um, template startup messaging for GDB. Uh, it says the core that we're examining was generated by example1.out, which makes sense. That's a program we ran that crashed and created a core dump. Program terminated with signal uh, sig seg v, which is seg fault, uh, gives us the text there. And then it crashed because we tried to run an instruction at memory address 61, 61, 61, 61. 61 happens to be the ASCII value for lowercase a. So we know that we were actually able to corrupt the program to the point where it tried to go to this memory location. So we probably overwrote the return address in the stack and it tried to go there and it crashed because it couldn't work. So this should be reviewed from last time. What we're gonna do now is see if we can actually manipulate and control the value that's in the return address. So what we're gonna do uh, initially is see if we can find out where that value is. Later on, we'll debug through GDB and see how we can um, determine this more intelligently, but we can really just start reducing uh, the number of bytes that we feed into it and maybe trying to create craft a pattern so that we'll know exactly when we've overwritten the return address. The idea is when we run that GDB command, we want the four characters or the four byte address to be one that we've crafted. So we know that our initial buffer is 50 characters. So I'll print 50 A's. Then I'll print a bunch of Bs, maybe 20 Bs, right? So at this point, maybe that's enough data. Um, so we should, when we run this, program crashes, and we'll see what we get um, as the overflown address. So here, 62. So we know that we're overriding it with Bs. Okay? We can start to reduce the number of Bs until we don't have 62s anymore or maybe we have three of them, and we'll know that we're close to being exactly at the number of Bs that we want. Okay, so mm, let's drop this to 12 and see what happens. Program still crashed. See here now we had a slightly different um, value reported. So it actually, the program crashed when it tried to go to FFFFD120. Um, none of those characters are 62, so we probably have too few bytes uh, that we're trying to override with. So if we run this again, uh, let's up this to maybe 16 bytes. We'll run it. Look at the core dump. Okay, we got all 62s. So we know that the memory address at this point is somewhere in between, um, you know, 12 bytes and 16 bytes away from the original buffer that we overflowed. So what if we did like 14? Okay, program still crashes. There we go. So you see here, we've actually got a 62, a 62, a 56, and two zeros. So that's actually, this is probably maybe the null terminator at the end of our string, maybe. Um, but regardless, we have two of the uh, 14 Bs that we wrote and then two remaining bytes. So we can sort of test our hypothesis if we make this 15 Bs now, we should see three 62s because we're sort of increasing the amount of data that we feed into this stack. Okay, so we're gonna make 15 Bs after 50 As. Okay, um, so again, the core dump happened. 62, 62, 62. So we think we're right. Uh, we've probably found the uh, location in memory where the return address is. So if we were to write 16 Bs, the last four would fill the return address. Those are the four bytes we're gonna to wanna to manipulate. Okay, um, what we're gonna do um, to sort of confirm this actually is we're gonna only print 12 Bs and let's see if if we print four Cs after 12 Bs, right? So we have 50 bytes plus 12 is 62, 
plus another four, or plus another four would be 66 bytes. Uh, we'll see if the program crashes where the only four C's that we're injecting are the ones that fill the return address. Good, so we got four 63's, 63 being the ASCII value for lowercase c. So we know that um, we've kind of landed on the return address with these uh, four letter C's. So if we wanted at this point, now we could start to pass in any value we want as these last four bytes, and we'll see that show up in the return address. For example, um, I can take up a C, and in Python to inject a byte, uh, we can, or a hex value, we can say slash x, and then the, the two hex digits that we want to represent the byte. So for argument's sake, we could say a, 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 a. Right, so this should crash the program with four A's, or all A's being injected into that memory address. Good. So we see that we can actually uh, manipulate the value in there. So now what we need to do is, if we recall the structure of our original program, we actually want to call this function when, main, when this returns. So what we want to do is inject into the return address the address of this function that basically simulates us calling the function. Okay, the problem is we don't know where that function is. So there's a few ways you can determine this. Uh, one of the ways to get the address for the function is to actually open up GDB uh, and ask GDB while the program is being debugged where the function is. I'll show you that first and then I'll show you a way that works if you are not running in a debugger. So we'll say GDB example one dot out to load our program. We're going to set a breakpoint in main, and then we're going to run the program. Okay, so our program is running. It's paused at the first uh, kind of line in main. Now to find out the address of really anything in GDB of like a variable of a function, you can just say print or short form p, and then the name of that function. For example, if I said print main, main starts at address five six five five six one b nine, and we can see that that's probably pretty close to here. You know, we're a few um, assembly instructions down in main, but a few up from this would be that address. So if I want to know the address of print message, which is the function that never gets called, I can say print me the address of print message. So apparently this function lives at 56556279. So what we're going to try to do is take those four bytes that memory address of that function and inject that, write it over top of the return address in our stack. So that when we corrupt the get message function, when we corrupt the get message function after this call to get string, uh, we should override the stack for this function. And when the function eventually calls return, its return address um, back into the main has been corrupted with the address of print message. So it should hop there and print the content there. We'll know this works because uh, we'll know that we were successful rather um, because we should see um, print message run. If print message runs, we should see the message um, printed to our console, welcome to buffer overflows. Okay. So we'll go back into GDB and grab that address. Oops. Uh, right. If you're not actually running the program or broken, um, you know, stopped at a breakpoint. Um, since the program isn't loaded into memory yet, um, we don't have the actual addresses of these functions. We have offsets, meaning um, this is how many bytes away from the start of the text segment this function will appear when it is loaded in memory. And we're going to use that later. But for now, I have to set a breakpoint in main, run the program. Then I can say print the address of print message. So I'm going to take that memory address and copy it, leave GDB, go back here to our print statement. And we know that right here, that address that I just erased was the location of our value uh, in the stack that we were after. So we could just insert the bytes like this. 
put a slash x in front of every two hex digits, and that's going to be our four byte memory address. If we run this, we're going to see it seg faults, but we didn't see it print out that string that we were hoping to see that says welcome to buffer overflows. There was a bit of a problem with the way we specified the address here. So if I look at the core dump file, interesting, we see 56556279, but they're backwards. It's because we forgot that um, the data has to be written in little endian format. So we have to write the bytes in the reverse order. So we know that we actually have to have 7962, 55, and then 56 will be the last byte. So now we've written the bytes in reverse order since it's little endian. So now we have the overflow, <clears throat> the overflow, some corruption of some data in between the string buffer and the return address, and then the value that we're inserting into the return address or sort of crafting into the return address. So we'll hit enter in main, calling get message. Welcome to enter message. You entered some big long string and we see the text, welcome to buffer overflows. That means we were successfully able to jump into another local function in the program. Right? We know this isn't a mistake on our part because we know that that function never gets called anywhere in the program legitimately, although it does get loaded into memory when the program is. So we were able to redirect or change the flow of control of the program so that it jumps to an uncalled function and executes that function. Um, you can imagine how this technique could be used in a number of different ways uh, for creating things like modifications to programs like that'll maybe bypass um, key checks or validation checks, maybe to call code that's been um, sort of deprecated but not removed from a library yet, um, or just to bypass sections of code that someone doesn't want to execute. Right? So that's one simple form of buffer overflow.